Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fashion and Retail Studies Speaker Series. I'm Kathleen Penley, a lecturer here in the Fashion and Retail Studies program. We're very excited to welcome you to hear Ronnie Robinson speak today. Um, before we begin, I want to mention there will be sign-in sheets that are going to be passed around. Uh, and we have uh, another a couple guests actually up front here uh, from a number of different companies. And I first want to welcome Dina Washington. She's the VP of Technical Operations at Tween Brands. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Such a nice crowd. I'm glad you guys came out. Um, as Kathleen said, my name is Dina Washington, and I am the Vice President of Technical Operations at Tween Brands. You may know us actually as Justice and Brothers Stores. Um, it's a real pleasure for me um, to be here today with you to introduce to you someone who I truly admire and respect, and that's Mr. Ronnie Robinson. For the past 14 years, I've worked very closely with Ronnie. Um, and in actually in researching the introduction that I kind of wanted to put together for him, I really came to know just how fascinating and interesting he really is. <laughs> yeah, so when he begins to speak, you will automatically realize that he was not born and raised in Ohio, but was actually born in Scotland. And something else I found interesting that over the course of his life, he's lived in six countries. He's lived in Ireland, Germany, Belgium, Hong Kong, and United Kingdom. And last but not least, the United States. And more importantly, for the last 14 years, he's lived in the thriving metropolis of New Albany, Ohio. <laughs> From an educational perspective, he studied textile chemistry at the Scottish College of Textile for three years, and then he interned for a year. Um, six months into that internship, he was a chemical lab technician where he wore a big white coat, lab coat, um, and the plastic glasses, to, you know, safety glasses. You know, kind of reminds you of those characters from the Big Bang Theory, and I know you guys know about that. Six months after that, he then switched to retail, and he worked for Marks & Spencer, which is one of the largest department stores in the United Kingdom. It's no surprise to all of us that he quickly identified that his future was definitely not in chemical analysis but in something far more fashionable than a big white lab coat. As a result, he chose retail, and instead, he accepted a full-time job at Marks & Spencer. Over the next 10 years of his career, he has held various positions from textile technologist at Marks & Spencer, fabric director at Mass Industries, and at the tender age of 30, he was promoted to vice president of fabric and color. And quite soon after that, he was promoted again to Vice President of Technical Operations for all of Mass Industries. After about four years of being at Mass, he then realized that he wanted more, and he wanted to go back to school to obtain his MBA. And he, he went to uh, MIT and graduated from the Sloan School of Management in Boston. Now, what's really important here is that because he is who he is, Mass Industry sponsored his education for that year. You guys know how important that is for someone else to pay for your education. This clearly shows that Ronnie's talents did not go unnoticed. Today, Ronnie is the president of Asina Global Sourcing, and this is yet another major accomplishment of his career that he is extremely proud of, and so are we. Ask Ronnie and he'll agree that while he has achieved much success, what he really wants most to be noted for is his interest and passion for helping and influencing young people to enhance their futures and the lives of their families. And that's what makes this opportunity really special today for you all and for us. So please sit back, enjoy, take notes, and welcome Ronnie today because this is a special treat for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. As my grandmother said, that brings a tear to a glass eye. <laughs> it's, uh, very, I'm really glad to be here. It's, it's not often that I get a chance to talk to uh, people who are not part of our, our company. Uh, so it's interesting, when, when I was asked to do it, I said, what am I going to talk about? What would be interesting? And I thought, well, 
if I were sitting here at school today, what would I really want to be worried about? I'd be worried about what is the future going to be, and I'd be worried about what is my role going to be in the future. So what I thought I'd do is spend a little bit of time talking about how, over the last 14 years or so, we've evolved at Asina in our sourcing organization, but also talk a little bit about the future and what I think is going to happen in the next, say, five to 10 years. So those of you that don't know Asina, Asina, everybody says it's, uh, you know, our CEO jokingly says Asina is the Greek god of shopping. <laughs> so um, it's actually a, a name that was made up, which basically represents the ascending nature of our business. And so Asina is basically five retail brands. You've got Justice and Brothers. We have Maurice's, which is a junior concept. We have Dress Barn. Um, which has been around for a long time, Lane Bryant and Catherine's. It's about a $5 billion retailer, um, and we recently acquired about 18 months, two years ago, the Lane Bryant and Catherine's divisions and, and then merged everything into one company, one holding company. And if you see, the way we think about our business is in this inverted pyramid. So you have at the very top the customer, the final consumer, whether she's a 10-year-old girl or whether, she, where, whether she's a plus size woman or whether she's a, a person that's been shopping a dress barn for a long time, that's the consumer. So the top of the pyramid is, is the consumer. Then we have the brands. And then what we call is our, our shared service group, of which AGS is a part of that group. Um, we service all five brands and all five divisions of the company. So our job is, you know, we're the, we're the, bottom, <laughs> the bottom feeders of Asina, if you like. We kind of service everybody, we try to do the best we can, and, that, and, the, and the role is very, very strategic because without us, we're not going to be able to put any product in our stores. So to talk a little bit about our business, um, we have, I, I actually have people in 12 th uh, different locations throughout the world. Every one of our brands is located in a different place, although in Ohio we actually have a couple of brands with Lane Bryant is in Easton, and uh, Justice and Brothers is in New Albany. And we have a shared service center in Pataskala, which is where I work. Um, and then we have our other brands that are based all over the country. Uh, Maurice's is based in Duluth, Minnesota. Anybody been to Duluth? It's pretty cold up there, so I was there last week. And then we have uh, in Mawa, New Jersey, which is where Dress Barn is, and Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, uh, which is where uh, Catherine's is based. But then we have our overseas o offices. Our three main offices are in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Seoul, Korea. Um, those three offices report into my organization. And then we have some satellite offices in other countries for th on the ground, um, people for quality assurance, production management, that kind of thing. So that's kind of the global nature of, of what we do. So talk a little bit of how we work with the brands. I want to kind of paint the picture for you a little bit so then we can sort of talk about how, what I think is going to happen in the, in the coming years. So you may be familiar with this, but the, the brands have you know, the creative aspect of what we do at, at Asina is really managed by the brands. We have our design team, our product development teams, the merchants, the technical designers. They're the people that, I kind of use the terminology, they're the people that give us the eggs and we have to go make the omelet. So they're the, they come up with the idea, the concept, the, the recipe for making that omelet, the idea for the initial idea of what that omelet's going to look like. And then they hand it over to my team, and our team is out there making as great an omelet as we can, as tasty as possible. So uh, all of that creative work is done in the brand wherever they may locate, be located in the United States. Um, and that includes things like tech packages. A lot of the group, the teams are here this morning, so with various tools that we put in, PLM tools, et cetera. Um, and they create the, the whole concept of what we're trying to achieve, and we, our job is then to take that and go run with it. Then we have the international offices. So we do not have a big sourcing team domestically. Our, our, most of our people, we have 312 people total in, in AGS. Two-thirds of them are in Asia. Um, and so the, over, the, 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 the designers, the product development team, et cetera, deal directly with the overseas offices. And those teams overseas are involved in everything you can imagine in, a, in achieving the first sample, 
the product development, the trim sourcing, the merchandising, quality, sampling, price negotiation, everything, everything that's to do with achieving the perfect sample, the perfect garment, the perfect, um, uh, the, you know, just to make sure that everything is done the way that the brands and the designers in particular want it done. And then that's, that concept, everything comes back here to Columbus or wherever the brand may be. <clears throat> And they make a decision on are they going to purchase that particular product. So all of that's done via various tools, including the PLM tool, email, telephone calls, video conferencing, etc. We do have a team um, that's embedded in the brand, uh, which is the sourcing team. Very small teams, but they don't get involved in the day-to-day -day negotiation, the day-to-day -day issues. What they do is basically, it's whatever the issue of the day is with the brand. They're the, they're the strategic partner for the brand. So if the brand is particularly looking for something, they, their job is to take that information and make it happen. Talk to their overseas counterparts. Talk to what's going on in the business. And they basically troubleshoot everything. You know, they're kind of, they you know, it's dial one for the product development team, dial one for the shipping team, dial one for the costing team. They do e literally everything. Um, but they're the kind of the glue, I think, in, in this because the overseas teams and the, and the brand teams are communicating, but this team kind of takes on board any of those special projects to make things happen. An example might be a, you know, a, a designer's out looking for something. She finds something. She might not have a lot of time on her, her plate. This team will say, oh, they're looking for a particular item, and they get ahead of it so that that we, we can have a sample made very quickly or, or we can get some things done without necessarily the designer even getting involved. This is uh, probably the most important part of a sourcing organization. Um, you know, the relationship with our factories, we have some factories we'd, we've, I've known personally for 25 years. We have factories that have been with us from the very beginning of our um, inception. And they are our, what I call our hidden headcount. Each of our factories has a number of people, and this is what I'm going to kind of talk about for the future. Um, you know, we have one factory that has 120 people on our account. Think about that, 120 people just doing business, and that's for just for the Justice brand. And they're doing all of the stuff down, down the side. They're actually the ones who are actually finding the fabric and the trim and making the sample. They're the ones who are actually doing the costing and coming up with the innovation and the product development uh, as we go forward. And the one thing that I would say, if I were a student today and I was going to be told, what, what do I really want to understand? The key element of our business go forward is, and the future of retail is product development. You know, people, if you want to go buy a t-shirt today, you can go buy a t-shirt anywhere. Whether you want it, it's a basic t-shirt or a fashion t-shirt. And you, why do you go to a brand and buy it? Well, clearly you have an affinity for that brand. If I ask, my daughter's a little bit older now, but you know, they wanted to live in justice. If I could actually leave them in the store, they would actually live there, sleep there, eat there, because there's food and everything, right? So they would actually stay there throughout the whole of their lives. And, they, and that's because of the affinity. It wasn't because they knew who justice was when we took them in. It's because the affinity they have for the brand. And it really all boils down to the product. Because you can buy a T-shirt anywhere, but why would you buy that justice product if you're a 10-year-old girl? It's because it's cool. It's because you want to look good, and it's because you have an affinity, and it builds your self-esteem by, by being in that, in that environment. And so the product, the product, the product, three rules of retail. Everybody says it's location, location, location. Today, it isn't. You can buy anything you want online. It doesn't matter where the location is. What matters is what is the product. And so whether it's Lane Bryant, and, and they're trying to move in a, in, a, in a more fashionable direction for their customer, whether it's Maurice's who are, who are moving towards a more internally designed product offering, whether it's Dress Barn who are doing the same. You know, Catherine's is, has a, a huge internal product development design team. Everybody is about trying to figure out the best product and why. And that's why if you look at what's happening in retail today, the people that are winning, not surprisingly, are the ones that have the best product or the ones that the customers are, are flocking to because they think they can buy the, f the best product, whether it's in the fast fashion environment or whether it's in traditional retail. And so this whole element of product development, what's happening today is the factories 
in Vietnam and in Indonesia or wherever they might be, they're hiring designers who are educated in the United States. They're hiring uh, wash experts. They're hiring people who understand print and pattern. And so the factories are coming up with a lot of ideas themselves and then are generating those ideas to retailers today. So that's a very important aspect of the future. And then we have a whole um, other element, uh, sort of our corporate support. So when you've got 312 people in 12 different locations, um, you need a human resource team. We have what we call a product integrity team. Uh, as many of you may have heard of, you know, a couple of years ago, what was happening in, happening in Bangladesh. Well, we want to make sure that the factories we're doing business in are compliant, that they're paying their workers fairly, that they're, if there is overtime, that, they, that it's monitored and that they're paying them appropriately, that the factories are safe that they have food to eat, that they have, a, a, in, in the case where they have to travel, you know, thousands of miles from their hometown, that they have an appropriate place to live and to sleep. So we have a team that's just focused purely on that. And we outsource it mostly to third party resources because no one person or no one team can possibly be in all these factories. We have 1,272 factories in Asina. Um, and so it's impossible to be in those all the time. So we outsource it to a third party uh, resource. Um, and we also, they, they're also responsible for the quality of the goods. So when the goods come in, we want to make sure that the quality is good. We want to make sure our customers are not disappointed. And then we have a bunch of other things that we do. When, when you have a diverse cultural business like we do, the, you know, the cultural aspect can't be overlooked. So our, the change management, the global workforce management by a human resource team is really important. And then we have the other stuff. You know, we're running a business. You've got to have a finance team. Um, we, and we have this thing called trade compliance. Um, many of you may or may not be aware, but every garment that comes into the United States, depending on where it comes from, has, we have to pay an import duty uh, or tax, basically, to the US government. And so. That all has to, has to be managed and appropriately paid for, and it's not an easy thing. They change the rules all the time. And so in reality, you, when you go out and buy something, if you go to an Abercrombie store and buy a T-shirt, or you go to a Forever 21 and buy a dress for a Friday night, part of the cost of that is actually a tax that you're paying to the US government for the import of goods. And so we have a whole team that's focused on, on looking at that. So what I want to talk a little bit before I get to the future is a little bit of the history of, of why, we do what, why we set up our own um, sourcing team. The, the overall objective was to gain control of our, supply, our overall supply chain. The vast majority of retailers 10 years ago, and in fact most of them still today, source their goods through third party resources, buying agents, um, you may have heard of Lian Fong, you may have heard of Mast Industries. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of them out there who do, and basically their role, because you don't want a retailer, if you think about a merchant, a buyer in a company, and maybe she's buying, uh, you know, 200 styles a season, she may have 20 factories that she's doing business with. She doesn't want to have 20 conversations about every style that she's making. So she wants to go to one person, and that person will then have those conversations with all the factories. And that's the whole concept of, we call it the middleman. So you go through that middleman who does all that work behind the scenes and then comes back to the buyer or the designer with an answer on whatever question she's asked. Otherwise, you need to hire a whole bunch more designers and buyers because they're going to have to deal with a whole bunch more people. So that concept of the middleman has been around forever. Um, and we decided we wanted to take the middleman out of the mix because we have to pay the middleman. If you go and you're paying that middleman, let's say 10% of the cost, and you're you know, a, a $5 billion retailer buying about a billion and a half dollars of product, you're giving away a ton of money. You're giving away $150 million of, pro of profit straight out the door if you go through a middleman. So we decided we would do it ourselves. And in order to do that, we set up these offices overseas and all the people that I, I talked to you about earlier. We wanted to develop factory direct relationships. The real important part of that 
if you think about it, if you're a factory, you know, maybe you're based in Hong Kong or Seoul, if you're dealing with a middleman, you're not quite sure you're getting the full story from the customer. If the customer, for whatever reason, decides they want to cancel some goods, which happens, you know, sales aren't quite as good as they were or whatever, they want to cancel some goods, the middleman has to take that information and pass it on to the factory and potentially the factory can get hurt in that conversation because the middleman doesn't want to lose, doesn't want to be held accountable financially. The difference for us is we're accountable financially. So when we deal with the factories and we have a cancellation, we figure out the best way to get them out of that without them losing their shirt. We wanted to maximize profitability, like I said. So AGS this year will do about $800 million of business and we'll make about $90 million of profit for Asina. And all of that profit goes back to the brands. It's a big, big number um, in our environment and it's a big number in our profitability. And we wanted to ensure that if you're going to go against these middlemen, and who are, many of whom are world class, that you can compete on price and quality and delivery. That's the trifecta of good sourcing. You know, you got to, you know, every, no matter what everybody, anybody says, pricing has to, be, has to be good. Retailers today are under intense pressure to increase their margins. You know, sales are tough right now in this environment, so the only way they can in improve is to increase their margins and that gets squeezed, the squeeze comes onto a division like us and then we have to go squeeze the factory. Qualities are given. You know, not everybody, I would say, cares about quality. You know, some of the fast fashion, I'm not gonna give names, but some of the fast fashion houses, um, you know, you can go, I call it Friday night wear. You know, you can, it's cheap, you buy it, you wear it on a Friday night and you throw it away on a Saturday morning, nobody cares. So, you know, that's fine. If that, that's their customer, that's what their customer wants, they don't really care about washing it. But if you're a 10-year-old girl, um, or you're a mother of a 10-year-old girl, uh, you want to ensure that that pair of jeans that she's wearing not only lasts as long as she, she doesn't grow, um, but also lasts for her sister and maybe her niece, all right? So you gotta be very careful when it comes to quality, depending on the brand that you're in. So, you know, some people don't um, care, others do. But that is an important aspect of what we do. So that was the original objective. And then what's happened is interesting. We originally set up the concept of saying, okay, if we go direct, we will compete with the middlemen. And so, over time, we realized, actually, we're pretty good at this. We're, we actually understand what we're doing. And let's get rid of the middlemen. Well, the first thing that the merchant said to us, well, that's no, we don't want to get rid of the middleman because we don't know if you have the best price. They want to compare one against the other because they're at, you know, their thinking is, well, how do I know I've got the best price? Well, the simple answer is they're raising their margins every year. We're making more profit for the company every year, and all of that profit is going back to them. So if you look, if you do a graph, it's very, very easy to see that in some, in, in some cases, our brands, have, their, their margins have gone up by 10 percentage points in the last 10 years, and we've added the sourcing income on top of it. So it's, it's gone up about 13 percentage points in the last 10 years. And the reason it did that, because in theory, they're right. In theory, well, if I don't know, if I give this to, if I give this to Lee and Fung and I give it to you, Whoever has the best price wins. If they don't have that comfort feeling, it's a problem. And the reason what's happened is the competition has moved from the middleman down to the factory. So the factories are now competing for the business. The factories, you know, you know, Justice buys a lot of products, so does Lane Bryan. When Justice goes to a factory and they do a two million unit cami order. They say, who would like the two million unit cami order? Well, the factories have fallen over themselves to get the business. It's a very important, you know, two million units in a factory, that might keep one line going for a year or two years. So what's happened is the factories have become the ones who are competing for the business. So they're the ones who've got sharper pricing. They're the ones who are giving us world-class manufacturing. And, you know, and you're all too young, but not so long ago, we used to have to worry about thing, a thing called quota. The US government imposed um, a restriction on certain countries to say you can only ship a certain number of units from each country. And it was really a play to keep China um, under control because otherwise everything would have gone to China. 
Well, that went away, I don't know, eight, nine years ago now. And so you don't have to worry about which country you're in anymore. You do business with people, and those people decide they're going to take you to factory X or factory Y, depending on which country they happen to be making it in. All we care about is the compliance of those factories and ensuring that the, peop the people there are treated appropriately. So that moved us to, to world-class manufacturing. We have great rel relationships with these factories now. You know, they come over here once a year. We go over there three or four times every year. When they come over, they, they, are, they are true partners in our business. And then what's happened is, as I said earlier, the factories have realized that in order for them to get more business, they can't just be an order taker. They can't just say, oh, you give me all the information and I will just go out and make the omelet. They, they, can't, they don't do that anymore. What they do is they have hired all these students, people like yourselves, who could go over and work. Not, I'm not saying you should go to Asia, but my point is if you wanted to, some of you may be from there, I don't know. If you wanted to, these people are hiring students like yourselves um, and coming up with the creativity. Think about it as a, a guy that used to just make denim jeans 15, 20 years ago. It was pretty straightforward. Well, now you've got everything in the, but the kitchen sink on a pair of denim jeans. Whether it's the back pocket detail, whether it's the wash, whether it's whiskers, whether it's rhinestones, whether it's whatever. All that stuff's happened in the last 10 to 15 years. And product development is going to continue and continue and continue. New ideas, new washes, new techniques. You know, way beyond my thought process. I'm not that kind of person. You don't want me picking the styles, trust me. But... You know, the people out there, the creative people who are there are the ones that really drive the business in the future. And so that's what's happened um, more and more when people are... And by the way, the same level of technical expertise is needed at retail, is needed because ultimately you want to be able to ensure that you're telling your, your merchants and designers, helping them come up with these ideas as well. So it's, it works both ways. You've got the manufacturing teams doing it, and you've got the retail teams doing it. So a little bit about product development. I've talked a lot about it, but I want to talk a little bit about how we do it and I a little bit about what I think the future is. So this is kind of, this timeline here is, is how Asina does it. And, and I, would, I would say that the majority of specialty brands will take this approach. There are others who have other techniques, but this is, this is a good average. So from the initial tech pack, everybody knows what a tech pack is, right? When you produce the, the specifications for the product. The initial tech pack, before you place an order in, in our environment, it takes somewhere between 10 and 12 weeks. So the, think about that. Somebody comes up with a specification package, goes over to a factory in Asia, they do the costing, they make a sample, it comes back. That's round one. That may, may take four weeks, five weeks. Then round two, they edit the assortment. They're looking for new ideas. They didn't like that style that it came in. It didn't, I don't know why we thought about that, but it didn't. we throw it away. Round two comes in. And that takes another three to four weeks. And then in some cases, round three. So that process takes th almost three months to come up with uh, from a designer's idea to something that we would buy. And the reason we do it that way is when you have a, a store like a Justice or a Lane Bryan, you want to have a coordinated assortment. You want the customer to go in and say, well, if I buy this top, I can wear it with this pan. Or I buy this, this suit, I can wear it with this blouse. Or I buy this T-shirt, I can, you know, if you're a Justice girl, my girl wanted to be head to, head to toe pink. <laughs> right? So you can be pink from a hat all the way down to her shoes. It's all coordinated. It's a coordinated assortment. That takes time. And so somebody has to pull all those garments together, multiple departments, and pull it together. Um, and so, and somebody wants to see all that. Typically, the CEO or the president of the company wants to see all that before we actually put a pencil and buy the goods. So that's why that process takes so long. And then we have our what we call our production environment, which is from the initial order, your fabric gets dyed, the garments get made. Uh, the wash gets done, and we stick it on a boat, hopefully. Sometimes we stick it on airplanes. We don't like to do that, but we stick it on an airplane or a, or a boat. And it takes roughly 12 to 14 weeks to get it from initial order placement into 
a distribution center, and then into the stores. So that's a typical timeline for a specialty retailer in the United States. So this term, fast fashion, I've used it today. A lot of people, I mean, it's, it's a big buzzword. Abercrombie recently announced that they're going to look at fast fashion. Um, I'm not sure that will work for them, but anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what they've said. That's how long it takes them to make a decision on what they want to buy. So all that stuff I was talking about, coordinated assortments, three rounds of sampling, tech designers being driven crazy by all the changes, um, that goes from 10 to 12 weeks to two to four weeks. So the way they work, they send their designers, they send their merchants to Asia, they sit in a factory, they look at a bunch of products, they take out a pencil and they place an order. That's their concept. Now, hard to get a coordinated assortment doing that way because you're going to be picking, you know, the sweater buyer's doing her thing and the denim buyer's doing her thing, and so they don't necessarily coordinate. The production lead time is actually a little bit longer because they're actually placing their orders so tightly that the factories may or may not have capacity to make the goods. So it, does, it could take a little bit longer to make, to make the goods. Not in all cases. In some cases, they get fast turn as well. But you're looking at a major difference between, you know, potentially 10 weeks, two and a half months of time that is saved in the fast fashion model compared to a traditional retail model. And my personal view is that this is going to be something that every retailer in America has to address because... It's okay. I mean, like I, I was joking about Friday Nightwear earlier, but if that's what the consumer is looking for, if that is what the customer says, listen, I just want fashion and I want it now, and I don't have to wait. I mean, when I was, I'm, I'm kind of old, but when I, when I was a, uh, a young kid, my mother used to take me in the middle of June to go get my winter coat because you had to get it before it was sold out, right? That's just the way it was. Back to school started for me before I left school. <laughs> because that's just the way, back in those days, the consumer was, was, that's just what they did. Well, you have to get the best stuff. And if you want the best stuff, you've got to get there early. Well, you guys don't even think about that anymore. You want the best stuff, you want it now, and you can either, if you can't get it in a store, you can get it online. You can get it whenever you want it. So this whole concept of buy now, you know, when I was a kid, Christmas was a big deal. <laughs> You know, it's the only time you got a gift. No, you don't. You get gifts all the time, right? So people are out there. They want it now. They don't want to wait until Christmas. They want to wait until back to school. They want it now. And so if retailers don't understand that, this fast fashion concept is just going to keep going and going and going. And eventually, they'll figure out how to get their quality to the levels that we already have in our brands because they'll, the factories will figure it out for them. And so what I think is going to happen in the future is that we are going to have more and more of this, and I think there's going to be a blend, probably, of all of this, um, because we, you know, you can't have everything on the left and everything on the right. That's just not who some brands are. But I do believe that there's going to be a mix. I think that what will end up happening is brands will have calendars that will be product-specific. There might be five calendars in, in a go at a retailer. You might have a calendar for your core product, your long lead time product, you might have a calendar for your fast fashion. You might have a bunch of calendars in between, depending on the nature of the business and what you're looking for. But it's all about speed. It's getting that fashion to the customer as quickly as you can, as soon as she wants to buy it, in bulk. And then the trick is you got to get out of it as soon as she doesn't want to buy it anymore. Because that's the, that's the key to an ex a, a successful retail. Have the product in the store when she wants to buy it, and don't have any when she doesn't. And I say to our merchants all the time, why can't you just buy more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's what we're talking about. And if you can make your decision 10 weeks later, you're 10 weeks smarter because you know what your consumer wants today. You don't, if you were making that decision 10 weeks ago, you're hoping that by the time the goods get in the store that she still wants to buy that. But if you're 10 weeks closer, you're probably a little bit more accurate in your decision-making process because fashion doesn't change that quickly. It can change quickly, but it doesn't change that quickly that you don't know what she's going to buy 10 weeks from that. 
So I think that this is something, and if I were you, you know, if I were thinking about some things to study and some things to really figure out, I'd figure out how you can get a specialty retailer to change their process from a 10 to 12 week pre-production process, maybe not to a two to four week, but let's save, let's save a month. Let's save six weeks. I mean, that's big money in, in retail. When you're talking about $5 billion retailer, we can make our decisions a month later or six weeks later. That's money in the bank for a lot of retailers. So I think that's really all I had to say. We've got some time, actually plenty of time. So I thought, I mean, it's much more fun for me if you've got specific questions that you want answered, whether it's about the, about the presentation or whether it's about anything. And, and you know, I'm happy to talk about anything as long as I can. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Go ahead. Well, I usually start with a talk in front of a couple of hundred people. And, and, um, <laughs> um, you know, it's a real, that's a great question because I don't know what my day is like. Um, you know, it used to be pretty straightforward. I just had one brand for a long time, two brands for a long time. And then now, when you're dealing with five brands and they have five creative teams and five presidents of a brand, um, they all have pretty big... Um, Oh, how do I want to say this in a good way? They all, they all want to do things their way. So my job today is, honestly, is trying to figure out how I keep five brands happy. And so I spend a lot of time communicating with those people, whether it's, uh, whether it's in Faye. I was in Duluth last week at Maurice's. I was at Lane Bryant yesterday, uh, Justice last week. So I spend a lot of time at the brands talking to the senior level people. So I have to plan out my schedule much more aggressively than I ever did before. Um, and I talk to these guys about this stuff, about how do we get faster, better, cheaper. Um, but I also talk to them about how we can help them. Because the, the real secret to all this stuff I've been talking about is not what my group does. It's what the brand does. And so guiding them, helping them, sort of advising, trying to get them to think a little bit differently. That's really what I spend my time doing. And, and I, I mean, clearly, I spend time talking to our, my overseas offices as well and my domestic teams. Um, but I'd say 90% of my time is really spent thinking about the customer and thinking about how we can help them and how we can help them move forward. Thank you. Yes? So um, it's an interesting question because our competitors, you know, within a scene, we're kind of a, a closed shop. So Heidi, right, you said? So we, our competitors at a scene are actually what we call the market. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but it's people in New York or in California who are importers of, of product. And they have their own design teams. They have their own uh, factories overseas. They import product. And they have their own line. They show their own line. And the buyers go in there and they buy from that line. It's not a real, it's not real competition to us because their pricing as a result of hiring all these designers and hiring all these people is much higher than what we can do it for. So they don't compete with us on price. But where they do compete with us is on product development. And so if a, if a, if a brand is not happy with a particular design group at their, at their division, and they don't like the stuff that's being served up internally, they're going to go to these guys to buy product because they like that particular design that they're producing for them. So that's one form of competition today. The other form is uh, uh, there are these agents out there, Lian Fang and Mast and people like that, who still do what we do. But it's something that um, I don't worry about too much um, because... We have a very strong model here. We have a very, um, very, I mean, it's, the, the brand itself is getting a lot of money back from doing business with us. If they do business with the money, with the middleman, that money goes out of the company. And it's a lot of money. So I'm not too worried about that side. But the market, and the reason the market is still strong is because of what I've been talking about on product development. They come up with these, they've got good designers, they've got good ideas. 
they show it to merchants, and the merchant says, I love it, I have to buy it. It's kind of a, you know, it's like Christmas. They come in, oh my God, I, I, I got to buy that, and it hasn't been served up by their internal design team. So that's the competition today. Another question? Yeah. I think it's a real worry, um, but at the end of the day, if the consumer doesn't care, um, they don't care. But I do think what's going to happen in the future is the factories will figure out the quality for them. You know, Forever 21 is a great example. They, they, don't have, they don't put tech packs together. They don't have a PLM system. They just go buy stuff. And if they have some things that are, happen to be there, oh, let's buy that. It's cool. It's cute. It's fashionable. And if you go into their store, I was in, I see, it was in their store in Shanghai, of all places, three weeks ago, because we're looking at opening some stores in China. And I was in there, and you go into Forever 21 in Shanghai, and they have everything from real, real bad stuff to real, real good stuff. But the real, real good stuff is cheap as anything. I mean, it's really ridiculously low prices. So I think what they're training their customer to come in and do is say, look, look at what we have. We have a great assortment. Buy what you want, and it's really cheap. But they will upgrade their quality over time. They will have to, I think, because there's so many fast fashion. I just read yesterday, H&M just in announced 19% in, uh, earnings increase in the last quarter. 19%. Zara's going through the roof. So these guys, but if you go, if you look at those three, they're the three people that people say about fast fashion. There's no doubt in my, my brain that Zara's got the better quality of those three brands. Then you've got H&M, and then you've got Forever 21. But Forever 21 are some smart, they're smart operators, so I suspect that they will increase their quality over a period of time. And if fast fashion ever does figure out how to get great quality, it's going to be a problem for a lot of specialty retailers. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. Somebody up here was going to say something. Any other questions? Go ahead. Okay, so in my current role, I'm not involved in it, but I used to be involved in it, so I can talk about it. So the way that most brands do it is a couple of different ways. Um, they will actually go out and physically shop their competition. So they'll go to, so they'll figure out who their competition is, number one, and they'll go and they buy what they call a market basket, and so they will go and buy, uh, let's say there's different times of the year, but let's say in this summer, they will go and buy 10 items, maybe t-shirts, shorts, swimwear, whatever. They will buy a particular basket in every one of those stores of similar product. It won't be exactly the same because every store is a little bit different, but they will buy a basket in every one of those stores. And they will average the price for those basket, that basket. So it, might, it would be the out-the-door price, not necessarily the ticket price because very few players now, the ticket price means anything. It, there's always some kind of discount, some kind of coupon or whatever. So they will actually make, get those baskets and average the price. And then they will look at the same product in their stores, their basket, and they will look at their pricing. And then they will decide where do we want to be in comparison to those competitors. So we might, you know, let's take, take Walmart. Nobody's going to be as cheap as Walmart, but do you really want to be as cheap as Walmart? And so they'll look at it and they'll say, let's go to an Old Navy, let's go to a Gap, let's go wherever. And they will look at those baskets and say, OK, their pricing on average is $37.27 for that basket. Ours is 43 OK, that's close enough. So that's kind of the one thing they do. The other thing they do is they actually look at the product that they're getting them. So this product's been internally designed. They put it up on a wall with a bunch of other products. And they think like a consumer would. They say, you know what, would I pay $29.99 for that t-shirt? or that pair of pants, or whatever it is. And so they look at every part of the product, and they say, yeah, I think we can get $29.99 for that. 
and their job is to try to drive their margin. So they wanna, obviously they want to get the highest possible cost they can, but they can't forget about the competition either because if they do and they start all of a sudden, your $10 difference from your competition, somebody's going to figure that out because in today's technology, everybody knows what everything costs. And so if you're, you, know, you can't buy a Justice t-shirt in any, in any other store, but you can buy something that looks like that Justice t-shirt in something else. So they have to be very careful about how they, how they price their goods in comparison to the competition, and that's how they do the market basket. But the other aspect is they literally look at every style and say, would you pay, you know, that one's $29.99. I think we can get $34.50 for that because it's, much, it's got a lot more embellishment. It's got a lot of things that we can do. So they adjust their pricing. And the other great thing about retail is, you know, something's not selling in the store, you've got two options. You can lower the price, which is what most people do, or you can increase the price. Because increasing the price is sometimes people think it's actually better than it really is. So they'll take that approach, but 90% of the time they're gonna reduce the price, take a mark down, get it out the door. But there are retailers out there that will increase prices. Parti obviously, particularly if something's selling really well, you increase your price, it's gonna slow down the sales a little bit because you might not wanna sell it that quickly. Sounds a bit foreign, but you, you don't want to be out of the goods before you get new goods coming in. So you want to keep some things in the stores to keep the customers coming until the new goods come. So you might actually increase the, the price to slow down the rate of sale. Okay? Yes? I wish I'd known a lot of things at your age. But, uh, don't get married until you're 30. No, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. I would say, you know, the thing that I look for the most when I look at people, I mean, I interview a lot of people, and I look at people who are successful in our company, and uh, particularly the young age. And I was successful at a young age. And the reason I, I was successful, I think, is because... I would work every hour there was. I would, and it's not that you have to do it that way. I mean, you know, modern, you know, a lot of people today are like, well, I want to have a private life. I agree with that. I, have a per I love my private life. I love the fact I've got my kids. I want to spend time with them. But when you're young and you want to make an impression, it's not just about working late and working hours. It's about enthusiasm. It's about ensuring that you, you know, if there's something out there that somebody wants to be done, I'll do it. I'll take, I mean, volunteer for projects, volunteer for things to do. Be enthusiastic. Speak up in meetings. Don't speak up too much in meetings, but speak up in meetings. Have a point of view. I mean, the thing that I find that, I, I, I'll be honest, so when I, when I was, I, I graduated and I lived in London, grew up my whole life in Europe, I got a job offer to go to Hong Kong. And you know, it was a kind of a point in my life where, what do I do? Do I, do, do I take this job offer or do I stay? The safe bet, I was on a very fast track at the retailer I was at. The safe bet would have been to stay there, and I probably would have done very well. But the difficult one was, you know, let's go to Hong Kong. Three years in Hong Kong, I can, you know, three years has turned into 20 now. But three years abroad, I'll learn so much in those three years, then I'll come back and I'll do something else. So... I think when you have the opportunities, and that doesn't mean I mean you want you to leave companies or anything like that, but when you have opportunities in your life, you can take the easy route or you can take the route that's going to challenge you. And I would just, I would just challenge you to challenge. Don't be afraid to fail is my, is my advice. You know, I don't know the exact numbers, but Babe Ruth's 700 and somebody would know, 700 and something home runs. I'm not a baseball guy, really. But he struck out 3,000 times. If you don't swing the bat, you can't hit a home run. And so my advice would be, if I were you, I'd go for it. I would really, really be aggressive and really try to drive my career in your early years until you establish yourself. Then you can kind of then think about other things that, that are important to you, like your family and your friends and all that stuff. doesn't mean you can't have a social life. It doesn't mean you can't have a social life, but it, but it means, I think, in the first five to six years of really you know, being that person, being noticed, because there's a lot of people who are looking, I mean, you know, I had a job, I had six job offers but the day I graduated, I didn't interview. Didn't have to worry about it because in those days, everybody got jobs. Today, it's tough. 
You're competing with everybody. You're not just competing with everybody in Ohio. You're competing with everybody in the world. And so companies are going to be very selective about A, who they hire, and B, who does well. Who, who goes up the ladder? Who's the persons that, who are the people that we want to identify on the fast track? And so to me, show a lot of enthusiasm, a volunteer for everything, ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. Because guarantee that everybody else is thinking the same thing. You're the only one brave enough to ask the question. I, I, I mean, I, I love it when people ask questions because then I can actually explain something and tell them, or, or, or it may get me to think differently. So why do you do it that way? I'm, I, well, we've always done it that way. So I think, I think it's a really important question. If in, in You guys that are coming out, you're going to graduate, you're going into the workforce. I would just say be really aggressive in your enthusiasm and really, really thoughtful about how you want to be, uh, you, how your career should drive you. Thank you. That's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.